So, we're in a rather chaotic political period right now, as you may have all noticed. That certainly manifested itself in the American election, which is still causing all sorts of perturbations. But you can see the same thing happening in, let's say, in Europe for, for the time being, right? And what you see happening, roughly speaking, is that the divide between the left wing and the right wing is growing. And extremism on both ends is also growing. And really, that's not a good thing, because we've had extremist right wing movements in the last 150 years, and we've had extremist left wing movements, and they weren't pretty. And maybe we don't want to bring them back. And so we have a serious problem. All right, so let's take a look at that for a minute and, and look at it seriously. So let's look at the left. And so I'm going to tell you some things about the left. The first thing is that people vote their temperament. And you need to understand this because when you're talking to people who are across the political divide from you, and I'm assuming they're relatively reasonable people, we're not going to talk about the extremists for a moment. If you're talking to people who are liberal or left, leading, then you're talking to people who are high in trade openness and low in conscientiousness. Okay, and so that makes them, roughly speaking, interested in ideas and creative, but not very good at implementing things. And, and then people who are on the right are the opposite. They're low in openness and they're high in conscientious and that conscientiousness, and that makes them not very good at thinking up new things, but pretty damn good at implementing things that already exist. And so, and so the thing about that is that both of those ways of interacting with the world are necessary under different conditions. You know, sometimes you have a good idea and you're running on it and what you need are people to implement the idea just as it is, efficiently and effectively and in an orderly manner. And away you go. But sometimes your efficient and orderly structure is not working anymore because the environment has changed dramatically around it and you need troublemakers with new ideas to come in and break things up so that you start moving in a different direction. And you might ask yourself, well, when is the time for the chaos of the left, and when is the time for the order of the right? And the answer to that is, we don't know. And that's why we have to talk. Because the, like, the environment moves around on us, right? It's constantly shifting underneath our feet. And sometimes it shifts so that we have to shift to the left to stay in the middle, and sometimes it shifts so that we have to shift to the right to stay in the middle. And the only way we can figure that out is by having political dialogue, and that's part of the reason why I'm a strong free speech advocate, is as if I should have to defend myself for such a foolish thing. You know, obviously. <laughs> so, you know, what freedom of speech First of all, freedom of speech is the cornerstone of our civilization. I think there's, 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 I don't think it's reasonable to even have a debate about that. And, and I think the reason for that is, is that free speech is how people think. Now, you might think you think, but generally you don't. What you do is ha rehash temperamental prejudices over and over again in your mind. And you actually don't think much until you write for other people or until you talk to other people, because they make you think. Because your assumption is just going to be that you're correct, Jen, unless you can really think, and hardly any people can think. Because, you know, really, it's hard. In order to think, you have to fragment yourself up into multiple personalities, each of which hold an opposing perspective. And, and then you have to let those opposing perspectives have a battle in the theater of your imagination. That's a very difficult thing to do. And so, um, don't confuse having your idiosyncratic prejudices with thinking. You have to be technically trained in order to think, and it's very uncomfortable and painful, and so people don't like it at all. So, generally what you do, though, if you speak, is that you put forth your view of the world, perhaps in the best manner that you can, but also loaded with your own prejudices and biases, because how, and your ignorance as well, because you have to speak from your restricted perspective, knowing as little as you do know, and with your personality, you know, first and foremost in your utterances. And then other people correct you. And hopefully you, en you enter into a real dialogue whereby you can transcend the, your own bias limitations and expand the toolbox with which you use to work in the world. And everyone benefits from that. And then you modify your viewpoints so that they actually work better in the future. Because that's kind of what it, what, it means, what it means to have uh, a useful and correct viewpoint is, do you have a toolbox that is going to enable you to work effectively in the world? And if you're too biased and, and too narrow and too ignorant, what that means is that your toolbox is only going to work in very narrow environment. 
And if you go out into public and you hammer yourself up against other people, especially those who don't agree with you, you can formulate the problems more clearly. You can discuss the possibility for consensus, and then you can negotiate an implementation strategy. And the alternative to that is that you're silent, you're a slave, or you're a tyrant. That's it. We devolve into conflict and fighting. And that's not a good idea. And we don't have to do it. Because we do actually know how to talk to each other. And although perhaps we forget very frequently why we should have to. You know, the other thing to think about is, you know, you don't exist just for who you are now. You also exist for who you're going to be next week and next month and next year and five years down the road and so on. And so you're actually a collection of people that extends out into the future. And so what that means is that you not only have to get along with yourself, you have to get along with all the people that you're going to be. And one of the ways to determine who those people that you're going to be are is to talk to other people around you. Because you're actually a collective that extends across time. And insofar as you're only speaking for yourself right now, you're not speaking for yourself as you're distributed across time. But if you talk to a bunch of other people, then what you're doing is approximating yourself distributed across time. So it's actually even in your selfish best interest to talk to a bunch of other people because they can help you represent yourself better than you're going to do it by yourself. We have the chaos of the left. And the left says, well, we need to tear down structures because they oppress. It's like, well, obviously structures oppress because something's good at the top of a structure and not so good at the bottom. So if you have any value structure, it's going to privilege some things and, and exclude others. But if you scrap the value structures, then there's nothing to live for. So we can't do that. That's just chaos. And then the radical right says, back to the nation. It's like, really? You know, we went back to the nation a couple of times, and it doesn't really look that great. And part of the reason for that is that the purpose of the nation isn't the nation. The purpose of the nation is to produce citizens who transcend and rejuvenate the nation. And so the nation should be pro properly subordinated to the individual, right? To the divine individual, for that matter. And that's what we figured out in the West. Now, it isn't that we only figured that out in the West, but so far we've been fortunate enough to put it into reasonable practice in our political institutions. And thank God for that. At least it's worked somewhere. And we'd be completely foolish to give that up because look at what it's provided us with. It's remarkable. We're free. As free as we can be, that doesn't mean that we're happy because freedom and happiness are not the same thing at all. But we did figure out that the state should be subordinate to the wisdom of the individual, to the sight and the wisdom of the individual. But that puts a heavy responsibility on everyone. That means you have to be the wise individual who can see and speak. That's your job. And if you do that, the thing that's so cool about that is, you know, you need a meaning in your life that enables you to bear the suffering of your life without becoming corrupted. That's the basic rule. And you have to build yourself into something that you can actually respect so that you can see yourself bearing that terrible existential burden properly. And then you don't lose hope and you don't lose meaning because you can see that you're strong enough to stand up underneath that burden. And then there's something about you that you can respect and that maybe other people can respect and that will help bring suffering in the world to an end and that will help people develop fully as individuals and that will enable us to avoid the dehumanizing, rigid, uh, sterile uniformity of the nationalistic left and the appalling, chaotic, devouring chaos of the radical left. How about no? The individual. That's the secret to the world. And you're all individuals, and so you're all the secret to the world. And all you have to do to discover that is pick up your damn responsibility. Stop listening to people who keep burdening you with rights. How many goddamn rights do you want, man? It's like you need some responsibility. So pick it up. Open your eyes. And learn how to make yourself articulate. And that way the world won't descend into the series of hells that it already descended into in the 20th century.